All right, I'm here at the USS Razorback Arkansas Inline Maritime Museum. I'm going to go take the tour of the uh, submarine here. I don't know if they'll let me record inside or not. I'll, I'll see what's, what's what. But uh, let me find out what's going on first. But this thing's pretty cool. This is like a two-person cooperation here just to shoot the gun and I'm sure there was three or four guys loading the damn thing it's pretty cool all right all right so they said I could video so we're gonna do it so we have this outer layer known as a superstructure which is basically uh, it's fiberglass plexiglass and wood uh, and then this this whole sucks through right up in here uh, and then we have this whole section here which kind of bubbles out those are ballast tanks, which you flood in order to dive, and also fuel tanks. And then there's a second layer inside of her, which is where we're going to be known as an inner pressure hole. Uh, apologies. So, very quickly about the boat. World War II built, 77 years old. Products of Japanese World War II, and then went through several upgrades post-war. Cool. Uh, 1970, she was finally decommissioned from the United States Navy, and then she was sold to Turkey as part of a NATO program. Which is why we have that Turkish flag up there next to the American flag up above. Oh, they were asking about yeah. it. I was us flying from Kansas City, so Turkish. Yes, sir. Because 1970 until 2001, she was part of Turkey. Oh, hey. About January of 2001, Turkey finally decommissioned her. They made plans to dispose of her. It's just getting a little bit too old, too expensive for them. Um, North Iraq found out about the boat, and after two years of negotiating with Turkey, we bought her outright for $37,500. Well, you got to think about the cost of the Give me $40,000 right now. However, this kicker, shipping. She's in Istanbul halfway around the world. We got to get her here. Ended up having to tow her. 47 days to tow her back and $750,000 in order to get her here. So shipping always gets in the end. Well, where you, how do you, you, you have to tow it through a river or something, right? So from Istanbul to New Orleans and the ocean, we just put her behind a tug. And then from New Orleans to Arkansas, we put her in between two barges, like the ones they have down there with the construction equipment. With a sling underneath, either side, sling underneath, lifted her up just a little bit, went up the Mississippi, then to the White River, and then from the White River to the Arkansas River, and just pulled her up that way. Uh, just got a quick quick question. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I'm a YouTuber. No, go for it. Go, no, 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 go ahead. I'm a YouTuber. I wanted to make sure if anybody doesn't want to be recorded on this, could you, uh, anybody okay with being on? No, go for it. No problems? no problems? All right, just want to make sure. Thank you. Uh, you have to be <laughs> it's internet. Uh, yeah. Apologies for my voice. <laughs> oh no, it, it's all good, man. I just wanted to make sure everybody, you know, was okay. Well, Otherwise, I'd avoid that person. You know. You're good, you're I will good. say, for health and safety, just be careful going through. It's World War II belt. Everything's steel on the inside. Just be careful going through the doors and hatches. Okay. Uh, and also, because we're only 20 years separated from active service, despite our best efforts, this boat's still around about 90% operational on the interior. Steel? Still. So we're going through, ask you please don't push any buttons, pull any levers, turn any knobs, anything like that. They won't say anything <laughs> truly dangerous is that button out of the way. So if you bump into something, we're not going to go under or go charging off down the river. Uh, was this submarine nuclear power? See, diesel electric. Diesel electric. Three diesel engines, two electric motors, which we'll see the engines. Uh, the motors are tucked down below. Kind so of how often have to be resupplied? So resupply outright. Uh, the food supplies last for about three months three and a half months that's how long you can go out and you have to come back in to get restocked uh let's get up on board and i'll talk about the fuel tanks up on the top but do you know when when they st when the first nuclear submarine was set out so that was USS nautilus i believe that was the mid to late 50s thank you and she is actually a museum ship up in connecticut somewhere i believe somewhere up north <laughs> uh, they don't let you go through her all the way because her reactor is still technically live <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll see a little further, but there's another layer right now This is one of the main changes they made. Originally, this was a teak wood deck. There was a wooden deck, like those slats back there, running all the way down the line. Uh, this is what's called the clamshell deck. This entire middle seam here, you put in those little crane assemblies, hook a little thing into it, and you can fold it open with the clamshell. Uh, in between where we're standing, where we're going to be, is our fuel tanks. There's about eight or nine tanks all together, equaling about 76,000 gallons of the diesel fuel. Uh, this boat can go around the world in a single fill-up. That's the range for the fuel. Wow. The, fuel, the food for the crew gives out long before the food, uh, the fuel gives out, pardon me. 
Um, and as we go on down, you have your safety line. So instead of these, this is just for Jimmy doesn't run into the river. Um, you have a safety harness onto you, a rope off the end like a tail. Look into this little assembly here, and it runs the entire length of the boat. That way, if you're washed over, you're just sitting that harness over the side, waiting for somebody to yank you back onto the boat again. <laughs> Or what's this thing for? That's a loading bay. That's what I thought. That's your torpedo loading bay. The way you load them on, while you're in port, the crane comes by, puts a torpedo onto the skid. About 12 men, six up here, six down below, put a nose cone in the front of the torpedo. They use ropes and pulleys just to brace it, just letting gravity do the work. Uh, the torpedoes are 21 feet long. The average weight of one is 3,500 pounds apiece. You count what's the only one torpedo? Uh, 24 altogether, eight in the back, 16 in the front. Um, that wood, like, that was original like that, like that was the wood. You, you, have the wood you would have the wood here just for the skid, yep. uh, but yeah, this would pop open, you just lower it down to there, and this folds down and tucks away whenever you're out. So there's another one, one, one like that in front. Yeah. But they just replace the, the wood once in a while, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Nice. And I wanted to ask, like, we're, we're stepping on the, on the paint coating, yeah. and it's really sticky, so it's like an oil base? We, we just repainted her. Oh. We just got finished painting her about a week ago. Oh, nice. Um, so it's a water-based acrylic. Well, originally, was it that uh, way? Originally, it's, it's yeah. kind of hard. It's basically whatever's on hand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so far Here's away, a bucket. Paint the damn thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good story about that. Um, so far away inside of her, going to the same hatch as the crew to view, so I do have a ladder. 12-foot ladder in, 14-foot ladder up in the forward room. Just be careful. Just take your time, and I'll see you all down below. Uh, I will also say this is going to be the smallest space we're going to go through throughout the entire tour. So you can make it through this, you can make it through the rest of it, no problem. Y'all right. just follow me. Go ahead, buddy. Call me through. That is pretty cool. I mean, every skin is so that's easy. <laughs> Go ahead, buddy. Alright. For a safety trip, you just do one at a time. Uh, always grab yourself with three members and just move one at a time. Yeah. Would you mind? Oh, like, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Going in. <laughs> and again, too much weight. You won't be able to fit down here. <laughs> they just came down that hatch here. <laughs> now we're inside. <laughs> I love stop the this video. My, so. my favorite photograph from this boat is this one right here. <laughs> does, it, does it head on the torpedo? <laughs> <laughs> So, I, this is a long question, but I guess this is only a shell. So, so yeah, this is the real deal, but they are deactivated. No yeah. fuel, no explosives. Yeah. It's uh, about a 2,000 pound paperweight right now. Yeah. Well, the, the head, there's this explosive oh, part, right? Yeah. So, the, the old ones, this is your Mark 14, World War II vintage. The warhead's about right here. What this copper cap is, is an impact detonator. So, inside that copper cap is a steel rod. When this thing slams to the side of something, it slams it back like a firing pin hitting a primer, and that's what detonates your explosives. Shows it right on that picture. Yeah. He said that 20 people working in these all the yes. same time. This is the aft and rear torpedo room. This is the back end. Uh, we're just going to go from back to front. Just don't leave anything behind. We'll be coming back to grab mm -hmm. anything. This room houses eight of 24 torpedoes. In the very back, we have four tubes two up on top, two down below next to the floor. That's where you launch the torpedoes out of. The crew always kept four in. And four out, so you have them all reloaded. You have a shot and a reload from two. Before you four out, I did have these two up top and the top two racks. Again, 21 feet long, average weight 3,500 pounds a piece. Uh, then directly beneath them on the floor, you have my bottom two racks. They're covered by the beds. Uh, you can see them here in the middle section. You can let go of my shoe. You can really see them up there in the in the back of the room and also in the front, kind of sticking out from the beds. So you you will uh, just roll this thing in here and then just push it over. 12 to 14 guys, run ropes to the little eyelets, yank it to where it lines up to the V, and then you either push them in or you tie a rope in the backside and you yep. pull them in. Um, 15 beds in this compartment, including this one up here above all of my heads. Uh, 75 of these beds got it throughout the summer for that 90 man crew. Lucky guy who wants to be up there. <laughs> That's the best bed in the house, excellent. Pretty sure it was expensive. To <laughs> uh, in order to make sure everybody did have a bed to sleep in, you deal with some as hot racking. Sarah bed with somebody else, you just rotate, work and sleep every time. So while they have some sleeping, they're yeah. all awake all the mm -hmm. time and yeah. moving off. So around. 20, yes, 20 people in here, 
Um, were they allowed to move in oh, yes. the ship? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, These, yeah there's we... no restricted section on board this boat. <laughs> Uh, there's always a floor beneath us, but that's floor for maintenance. This yep. is your only living quarters, this, yep. this compartment in here. Oh, uh, this floor, I should say. Then the bags and the beds as well. This is what's called a sea bag. This is one man's suitcase for an average three month long patrol. That's your clothing and your toiletries and everything else. There's no laundry on board. Whatever happens to your clothing, it's just whatever happens to them. Uh, shower? No. There are two showers on board, but there's, I'll get to that in a little bit more forward. Nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> This is just a locker. Storage bridge. lockers, mm -hmm. <laughs> more for spare parts, and supplies, and things like that. Not really for the guys. I, I, I see we have a fancy system here. Like we actually have each bag. But what's it like? Oh, that for that so too. the pipes are original, but the air conditioning is not. It had a heater, but no air conditioning. This is just the way in order to make sure you surface, you can be able to vent out all the compartments at once and get fresh air throughout the entire boat all at the same time. Under the sea, under the sea, cold. Under the heat, right? <laughs> Under the other, well, this boat average is about 85 to 90 degrees, even while you're underwater. The engines, right? Even though? Even though, even with that. Yeah, the engine rate is about 140. But we're getting <laughs> I'm just saying, that's what heats up the whole boat, though. <laughs> so, uh, I'll, get, I'll say what that is when we get to, that's a backup system. I'll get to what it's for whenever we get to the very, when we get to that lane system. We're going back to, basically, there's like a radiator to cool the air and then cool inside with a sea or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I no, there's there's no cooling system. The only cooling system on board, we have a fridge and a freezer, and then also the uh, the sonar room, which is down beneath one of the compartments, has a water cooled air conditioner, so just for the equipment. People were here all the time, 89, 89 degrees. degrees, you're just... Three months long, the only people working here, yeah. uh, three months. As we go forward from here, uh, just watch your head for the bulkhead. We're also going to walk past the first toilet or head. This is the first of four heads that are on board. That was the only. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, and uh, well, odd thing about them the green lever and the yellow knobs in there back behind the toilet is your flushing mechanism. For these things, it's a 13 step process to flush. How, really? how many? Pull the green lever, turn all the yellow knobs, pull the green lever, turn all the yellow knobs, pull the green lever. That must suck when you got green. diarrhea. Yes, it does. <laughs> well, especially you must take the whole place out at 85 degrees. <laughs> the reason why it works that way is that there's a pressure difference between inside and outside. So it's fighting water pressure. So if you mess up one of those 13 steps, it blows up on you, what's called whooshing. It's <laughs> from the toilet, hits the ceiling in there, or if you're sitting on the toilet seat, it would launch you off the seat with a fountain of water coming right up behind you. It cleans up real nicely. I was going to say that's a second shower, ain't it? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, well, it's a, it's a, it's a shower of soap. Not clean, but... Sure. You can at least have a door, so you have that amount of privacy, and you also, there's a drain down there in the floor, and you're sort of the, the, accident. You know if that ever happened? Like, oh, yeah. A very common thing to do is tell a new guy one of that's wrong. So the first couple of times he tries to flush the toilet, it blows up on it, it's time for everything he's doing wrong, or you just pre-sabotage it. So the next poor guy that hops in there after you, that's the first step, just immediately blows up on it, no matter what he does. Damn. the noise. <laughs> yeah. As we go forward, mind your head coming through the bulkhead, also watch your feet. Uh, we're going to walk through this next compartment here. This is the smallest room in terms of space. I can barely fit two people in here, let alone all of us. Yeah. Uh, this room is maneuvering. This is the electric controls for the entire submarine and also propulsion. So all the electricity flowing through here is controlled in this compartment. Uh, I'll talk a lot more about it though once we get to the engine room. It all kind of flows in together and have a lot more space in there. So, so this is especially the part don't touch anything though. So. Yeah. <laughs> 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 now I remember when those uh, sirens were going off, people were hopping through these things like in two seconds. <laughs> yes. Oh, there's a Where you would be. Oh, and well, they look behind the Turkish. Papa, the Turkish. No, in England. Wow. Yes. 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 Got to catch up to these guys here.
if you're if you're one person, you have to learn every last button, dial, knob, switch, lever from back to front. Not mention that probably you have to know the functionality. Yep. Of it, you have to know what it does, how it works, how to use it in an emergency, that sort of stuff. Yep, that's the one thing about the Navy is that you got to know every station. Every station. Yep. Exactly. The cook knows every last. He knows how to turn these things on again. I, I was told about the dolphins before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you wouldn't mind recapping that, because well, whenever I, whenever you, you go through your schooling as part of a submarine, first off, submarine service in the Navy is all voluntary. They never assign somebody to one of these submarines. You have to volunteer to be on board one of these things. It's an all volunteer force. Um, you go through about World War II is about three months of sub school, and then once you get on two year submarine, you go through so it's a qualification or a qual process. So that's when you learn all the systems on board, your entire boat, every last button, dial, knob, switch, lever. Uh, and then after you complete that process, that's when you get your insignia, what's called your dolphins. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, you're qualified. Uh, the dolphins are kind of odd in the rest of the military. It's the only insignia that you can transfer between branches. So if you leave the Navy, go into the Army, you can wear your dolphins on the Army uniform. Um, we've seen people in the Space Force that have their dolphins on them. Um, but yeah, until you qualify, you're what's known as a non-qual puke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you said they go like 90% operative, but no way you're going to start this thing without there. <laughs> so this one doesn't work, yeah. this one also doesn't work, but that one in there does work. Now what's that again? Because I was way back. So these are your diesel engines. Okay. So these are your generators for the uh, power on board. Yeah. Three. We started out with four, and now we have three. They did testing in the mid-60s and realized that having four engines on board was overkill. Mm -hmm. So they just went, <laughs> yanked it out, replaced it with DC to AC converters from the new lighting. Um, so these are manufactured by a company based out of Chicago called Fairbanks Morse. <laughs> Prior to World War II, they specialized in making diesel locomotives and most other things. So these are two train engines modified for coming from the submarine. Uh, this is only half the engine that we're looking at right now. There's another half mirror down beneath us under the floor. Yeah, that's the rod side. Mm -hmm. The crank it with right now. Technically, there's actually two crane shafts on it. Two crane shafts. It's a ten cylinder, but a twenty piston engine. Within each cylinder, you have two pistons staring a cylinder. They fall down, use those as a firewall, and sort of bounce back off each other. So it's sort of doing this inside the cylinder. Higher compression, right? Mm -hmm. Very reliable engines. Once something does break down the side of them, it's a pain in order to try to get in there and fix anything. Uh, was the submarine able to navigate only with one? Yes. The only thing, the only thing these really do is recharge with uh, your batteries. So when we go into water, we can't run these engines anymore. It sucked the air off the crew in here in about an hour. So we're running off of battery power while we're underwater. Uh, 252 batteries in two rooms, 126 each. Each battery looks and works like a car battery. They're lead acid. Each one weighs about a ton. They're about five feet tall. You have 252 one-ton car batteries on board the boat. Uh, battery life at a full charge lasts for five days in the water. That's long the lights and everything stay on. And then the air quality lasts for about six to eight days, give or take. Depends how many guys you have on board, how many cigarettes you smoke, that sort of stuff. Or they're allowed to smoke cigarettes. Yes, you're allowed to smoke cigarettes. In fact, one of the issues for these, well, first off, um, would y'all like to hear a recording of the engines rolling? Yeah, sure. I wonder if this is going to work today, so let's just see. Uh, three, two, one. And it's only one engine. That's 30%. 30% of one engine. Only. That is a recording of one engine idling. Not helping out for the sound quality. They maybe not get these big hearing protects until the 50s. World War II crews, you take cotton balls, stuff a cotton ball down the side of the ear, or you took a cigarette after you smoked and you stuff the butt down the side of the ears. Any thing you could try to get the sound down. Um, also, it being 140 degrees in this compartment, these things rolling, uh, these men only work a half shift. So you're not supposed to be here for the full shift time, it's about eight hours. These guys are only supposed to be here for about four hours at the most, even if you rotate. Uh, we can only run these while up on the surface. Um, well, barring some weird things they did, they put on what's known as a snorkel in the 50s, like a snorkel used while swimming, it's a big old 50 foot tall smokestack. So you can technically run the engines while you have that smokestack deployed. So you can stay in the water 50 feet and still run everything, just venting out that stack. Uh, the crew hated to use it, though. Had a bad tendency to clamp shut if they detected water in the pipes. So first off, all the exhaust that come out floods into this compartment here. You couldn't see the doorway back there for the exhaust. Uh, then second off, the pressure change from all the air now being sucked in from the inside and sending from the outside would pop everybody's ear drum at the same time. Uh, however, once they installed that snorkel, the longest amount of time this boat has stayed in the water continuously was a full three month long patrol during Vietnam. You said they have how many batteries? 252. 252. Is ton. And produce how many power? Uh, it's 60 volts direct current, it's 120 volts right now alternating current. 
illuminate your own. But you, you know that was the capacity in kilowatts? Right? I, I don't know. Top of my head. That's yeah. As we go forward, we're going to walk through the next two rooms. Uh, just be careful around this next engine. It's our operational one. Uh, we're going to stop again two rooms forward in their cafeteria. We have one of our pistons. A diesel engine there. Freshwater stills. Desalinization plants, making it freshwater. Cool. Oh, no kidding. Huh. Diner style. You'd honestly be surprised how much stuff out of these ended up in the RV craze in the 40s and 50s. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure a lot of the uh, engineering was mimicked here. I mean, you know, from here to yeah, there. Yeah. So where's that go? When we first stepped onto the boat, does that chain us to don't go past here? It's just right there. Okay. We stepped onto the boat right above this first row of beds here. Oh, okay. Well, I was in a hurry to catch up. Yeah. Catch up to you. Yeah. Come all the way forth from that. All right. This is like first class right here, man. It's not supposed to be. No? We do sleepovers. We do overnights. Lots of Boy Scout troops, Girl Scout troops like to spend the night on board. So that's where we put those people. Nice. Uh, there's 35 beds in there. At both sides, we have 35 beds. Yes, sir. I guess it's one of the dorm, basically. Yeah, that, that, yeah it's, that's your main bedroom. Uh, it's also, this entire compartment from that doorway to this doorway is your after battery. So under the floor of those beds is half the battery. So 126 batteries down in there. Underneath there. Underneath there. And this is the crew. This is your cafeteria. Mm -hmm. Now, this is it for the enlisted personnel, the regular guys. Okay. The officers do have their own little fancy dining room called a war room. A little more forward of this, like a teacher's lounge. Uh, however, back here behind this wall and around this corner is my only galley or kitchen on board the boat. There's no difference what food was prepped for them, just where they ate at, and the officers also got the fancy china place to eat off. They bounced these off these old pirates. Did they have magnets on the They did not. <laughs> you have lips. Okay. Uh, no Are you able to turn upside down a submarine? So, the most vulnerable that a submarine is in that sort of situation is going from up to down or down to up. If you're stuck out in the storm on the surface in the submarine, you do not want to dive it. Because there's a point about halfway down where the buoyancy gets a little bit iffy, and that point you can roll corkscrew. Yep. Uh, at that point, you, uh, well, lost control for a little well, bit until it decides what's. Well, can can, can a submarine go upside down? Or is uh, not, it's not it, recommended? It can't. It can't turn upside down completely. The buoyancy is just enough to keep it from turning. Uh, we also, they're folded up right now, but we have what's known as dive planes. So their wings folded up to sort of come out just to sort of stabilize her while she's underwater. Um, the main thing I can talk about in here is a giant hole in the floor in the middle of the room. Uh, the grate down there is something we've put in place. You can look down the side of that. The hatch or doorway on top of that used to be about five or six inches thick and it weighs 200 pounds. That's your fridge. Oh, that's your oh, refrigerator. I was about to ask about that. Um, where do you store all that food? Yep. For? That's the fridge. And then the doorway down in there, going this way, uh, everything from about here to the wall is your freezer. So you have a climb in fridge, walk in deep freeze down inside of the fridge. So this is the cooler, cooler part of the whole thing, yeah. technically? So the crew have to come here to get out of whatever he needs for the meals yeah. that he's going to be prepared for that. Now, I will say, when you leave, it is packed full, floor to ceiling, wall to wall. It's so about the first month. The only thing you really do to figure out what you're eating is you pop in the door and you just look down. Breathe in. Hmm, that looks good. Yeah, that looks good. You ate your way down to you can see the doorway into the freezer, and you just sort of eating your way into the freezer. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's part of the service, I guess. Uh, there are four meals prepped every day breakfast, lunch, and dinner, then midnight rations or mid rats or late night guys. Uh, an average meal for these men, you move 60 men through here in 45 minutes. So 20 guys, 15 minutes, eat your food quick, get out. Next 20 from shuffling on in. Um, <clears throat> Summary service is part of the volunteer effort. They gave them hazard pay. World War II is about double pay. Right now it's about one and a half times. Uh, and you also got some of the best food in the fleet. You can manage it. So you always had good food. Um, I will say the food quality tended to go like this. 
towards the deployment. Uh, so by the end of it, if you're lucky, you know, yes, that's fake. Uh, about a, a little month, bit of mustard. <laughs> about half, about a month into, into the patrol, uh, there'd be an announcement, or they'd hang a sign on the milk dispenser saying that the cow has died. Uh, because by that point, all the milk is spoiled, so you would start having powdered stuff past that. Um, this room is also your main rec room. Card games, gambling, poker is very popular on board the submarines. Uh, you could also smoke on board these boats to the early 2000s. You're already huffing a diesel exhaust, might as well have a cigarette and breathing in worse things already. Uh, they also use as a canary in a coal mine. If you've been underwater for a couple of days and you try to light a cigarette and it won't light, you run out of oxygen. Time to come up with some air. Uh, but also about for the recreation are the tables. Ooh, the table cloths is a board game pre built too. Mm. The two up front are backgammon, those are checkers and chess boards on the back side. Oh, uh, Just to save that tiny little bit of space. Well, at the same time, how much free time do you really have for a game? Crew worked eight hour shifts. Eight hours of work on duty, eight hours of recreation where you're sort of on standby, but you do whatever you want to pretty much. Uh, and then eight hours of rest. So at least for a third of the day, you can pretty much do whatever you want to do. And those hours schedule still standard today? I, I believe so. I believe so. Because you mentioned about the time that they have here to be able to eat and then yeah. get yeah. up. Yeah. So I'm, I, I just guess, you know, the size has changed. The size, the they've gotten... Changed, but, the, but the schedule is still standard in the Navy or... The, uh, I know the ballistic missile submarines because our executive director is a old boomer. He's an old ballistic missile. He was a missile tech. Um, they, his submarine, I believe, had about four floors to it, uh, and then it was about another 50 feet longer than ours. There's a little bit more in the front. Um, but the size on the inside, some places has gotten worse. So they pack it full of more computers and more equipment and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's about the same right now. The same rotations, the same schedules. Rotations. The main difference, though, is that uh, they do. You have two crews on board of a submarine. You have an A crew and a B crew. They go out, you go out for 100 days to the A crew, you come back up, come back into port, and you trade off for the B crew. So you have 100 days off, and the B crew goes out, takes the boat, and you just rotate. And you have about a month of time in between to do maintenance work on board the submarine, restock all your supplies, uh, check your missile tubes, check your torpedo tubes, that sort of stuff. Were, were they, back in the day, were, were allowed women to serve in the submarine? Not until 2003. Yeah. And even then, it's only officers right now, I believe. There's no enlisted women. I see some. Uh, Those are backups for your ballast tanks. Okay. So the main thing about damage control, the boat can't survive two compartments flooded with water. Past that point, it gets a little bit iffy. It really depends how deep you are. But if the main ballast tank controls are in the next room, that room floods, explodes, catches fire, all three, then you have your backups in here, so that way you're not helpless. Okay, so you'll have to come back. Yeah, you have to come back in here. You have to manually adjust all of these, uh, and they're color coordinated as well. Uh, green. This is non-potable water. That's pretty much salt water. That's coming from the ballast tanks. The yellow, this is potable water. Uh, this is also probably septic. Uh, yellow is your potable water. That's drinking water. It's fresh water, puts it to desalinization plants. And then red and black, which I don't know if I have a black one in here. Uh, that's your fuel lines. That's your diesel fuel tanks. So it's running along with this. There's fuel, but there's fuel, the hydraulic time. fluid, everything. In fact, funny story, when you look over here inside the galley, you notice there's a little vent hood. This is where the coffee pot used to go. During one of the patrols, they had a leak in the hydraulic line. I like line. coffee. Had a leak in the hydraulic line dripping down to the coffee pot. Means you were regular. Means you real nice. By the end of the patrol, they were going through all the toilet paper, they were going through all the bed sheets. So, what's that thing do above your head? Main induction valve. This is the opening and closing for the vent system. The easiest way to kill yourself when you go into water is to have this thing open when you dive. Because you get water going through the vents in every last compartment all at the same time. I'm just gonna come through. Mm -hmm. So the main cook's main job during the dive is to come in here, shut this thing off, and then yell into the control center the main induction valve is shut and locked. Uh, the only thing it does right now is leak hydraulic fluid on us. So you use one, <laughs> one man job or mistake and can kill yep. everybody. Yep, and it's uh, you take that and you time to buy about 50. <laughs> So the next compartment here is going to be command and control. Be nice with the kitchen in there. Everything's electric. There's no gas appliances. Three stove tops, a deep fryer, and the two ovens down beneath. I kind of figured that when you run on batteries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, you know, you. a gas leak, a book plus cigarettes. Yeah, yeah. I can still do it. <laughs> oh, this is a screwdriver spot. That's radio. Yep.
I knew what that was. I'll explain later. Doing that. I just sort of sit down in the hatchway and just do one foot at a time. Yep, I'll do one foot at a time. Right? <laughs> was there a specific point you said that everybody was volunteered, but I guess they have to have certain height limit. Height, height limit in World War II was 5'8. Five, eight. Five, eight. I'm over that. Yeah. Holy crap. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, there is none right now. Mid 60s, they had a lack of volunteers for the submarine service, uh, so they went, well, okay, we're just going to drop the height limit entirely. You can be 6'10 and be aboard one of these things. That kind of happened during World War II, too. I mean, oh, yeah, they yeah. started running really short on men. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm 6'1 and all I'm comfortable with this thing. Yeah. So, I will, I've worked here for about three and a half years, and I have knocked myself on a board this boat. Yeah, but you, you put another 60 guys in here, you won't be comfortable no, no more. No. <laughs> um, Especially when you got to run. Yeah. This room in here is your command and control center. Uh, this is our brain. Uh, we are located about right here in my little bottle. Uh, this here is the only compartment on board with three floors to it. We've always had a floor below us, now it's a floor up above us as well at that ladder. Uh, up there is the base of this structure, and that's where you're probably the most familiar with from movies and TV. That's my conning tower. That's your periscopes. We have two of them up there. One is for torpedo targeting, has a nice sort of cross in it, like a scope. The other one is just a general use big old pair of binoculars. Up there as well, I have my uh, radar set, my fire control computers for the torpedoes, including your locks button, and your main helm station. The main helm is the same size, color, and shape as those two red wheels there, except it's up there by itself. Main helm up there, secondary helm, in case that room explodes, floods, catches fire, all three at the same time. But those control the back rudder, left and right, port and starboard. This Which one? one so, the one up there, and then this one. Okay. Is that, that's where the captain says, like, hey, give me five. Yeah, I'll, I'll give me, you know, two degree uh, support, four degree support. Those two wheels there, what's called your diving station, this entire wall, those control the two wings on the side of the boat, called your dive planes. So, when we go into water, that works like a wing in an aircraft. It's basically fly to boat while you're underwater. Then beneath us, I have two rooms. Uh, there's a small machine shop back there we've all walked past. There's a lathe, a drill press, to mill some things down. You can make some spare parts. Can't do a whole lot because that's the only access point. So good luck trying to get anything down in there. Uh, then everything but the lathe is about this big. You can't really do a whole lot, but it's better than nothing. Then down with this hatchway over here, uh, that leads down to sonar. Sonar is going to be that pinging noise. Always here in the movies, just echolocation like what a battery dolphin uses. And that, that's what they use to navigate. That, it's that's the only thing you use. Kind of. Um, that's what's called the ping. Is what's known as active sonar. And active sonar. The problem with it is like turning on a flashlight in a dark room. You can see what's around you, but everybody else can see or hear that sound. So what you're usually doing is you have a guy down there in a pair of headphones, sort of a large microphone that's dipped down to the ocean, called passive sonar, called a hydrophone. Um, very powerful microphones. Uh, World War II microphone could hear a ship from about two miles out. Uh, right now, the easiest way to tell if a vessel is above you what nationality is, you listen for the hum of the electricity going through the lights. Because each nation has a different frequency, that's why the plug-ins are a little bit different than every nation. So you listen for that, and that's how you can tell the nationality of the vessel that's above you, just listening for that frequency. Uh, I'm talking, you can hear conversations. And, uh, so that's why everyone has to just shut out. Right? And, yeah, that's, you go quiet, everybody shuts their mouth. Uh, these old diesel boats are actually acquired in the nuclear submarines. There's always a hum coming from the reactor on a new boat. You can't really shut off the reactor. Uh, these submarines, you turn off everything, you turn off the lights, get everybody to shut up, and you're, they can't really hear you. Uh, but at the dive station as well, I have these two depth gauges. Large ones on the left and the right, a shallow depth gauge, go down to 165 feet. This is what we're going to use about 80% of the time. Main depth gauge in the middle, that goes down to 600 feet. That's your crush depth. I'm about to make a question. Going before, like, is it possible like this submarine could take a nuclear submarine? Yes. Being, being on the fact that this is wider. Yes. Oh yes. Damn. Yes. That's crazy, man. <laughs> um, you can't go past your crust that for a limited amount of time, about a day or so, if you get real lucky. Uh, however, just over time, it just crumples it. Uh, the deepest this boat has gone was 900 feet in the 1950s. So we have gone past that crust at about 20 or so other times as well. For uh, Ac purpose or just accident? Like accident. We hit 900 feet about like that. Damn. How did it take it out? So, unaccounted for weight in the forward torpedo room. Took a dive like this at 300, sucked it down to that to 900. 
Uh, you throw the boat in reverse, you start backing her up, and then you start trimming off your ballast tanks, pumping in compressed air into the tanks in order to get the boat leveled out. Once you get her leveled, you do what's known as an emergency blow. There are four valves scattered throughout the boat to hit all at the same time, and it flushes everything with compressed air. Forces air out, makes you buoyant again. The only issue with that, though, is you have no control over it at that point. It's like a cork. You come up so quickly that the boat breaches the surface, you get about a half second of free fall. The boat gets air. You come up, and you slam back down again. In aircraft, in aviation, something like that would have some physiological effect on you. How is compared to this one? Nothing. Nothing. So These guys, the, the air pressure... The pressure station will change or... Pressure it's like a pressure here. chamber in here. Yeah. Pressure station... But, but then it's the... Uh, what's that? It's a... It's a yeah, because it's just the in. So, just the air. The right? so, boat oh, wow. takes everything. So, when you dive, what you do is start it off. You take a piece of string, you tie it off on the wall on the run side, you string it across the other side, tie it off so it's sitting straight. When you go underwater, the further and further you go, the more and more the walls are compressed. So that string sags. Now, I will say, doing an emergency blow, especially from that 870 feet, did put a lot of strain on the boat because everything blew back up again. Uh, but other than that, didn't really, don't get the bends or anything like that in these guys. Uh, that's why the escape hatch we're going to leave out of in the, in the forward room is a pressure chamber. It floods with water, help equalize water pressure, you can make an escape out the boat if you need to. I mean, the submarine was made with mostly iron on the walls? Or? Steel. Steel. High tensile steel. About that thing. And they, they use rivets, I guess, to put it Welded. Oh, it's welded. welded. Okay. If it was riveted, when it bends in and compresses, the rivets would... There are rivets though, right? In there certain are places that, that hold places. stuff together, right? Yeah. yeah. Mostly for access points. So now, thank you. Thank you. Here we go again. Who's John Doe back there? Gilman. <laughs> That's your secretary. <laughs> that's your logs, your records, and that man's paymaster. Paymaster? You don't piss him off. <laughs> yeah, these are your officers. So this is the, the, the place where, where you said it was like the... This is the officer's mess. Yeah. Uh, this is one part officer's mess, one part uh, surgical theater. This is your operating table. So this is uh, officers. Really? Yes, this is officers. Captain, lieutenants, uh, second and third command, and then your uh, two Ensign. petty officers. Thanks in the back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I battle with that, man. Any chance that you can blend to the center some information or something, a picture of that? I can tell you where to get it. Oh, really? Perfect. Junior? It is. Well, there's no floor down beneath. Well, there is a floor down beneath. It was the actual bottom of the boat. They took both floors and this one and smashed them into one. Originally, the floor would have just continued like that box straight on down. So that's, okay. that's why you have that drop. That's why I noticed that. Yeah. Those were the, the fussy quarters, right? That's your officers. Nice. The only real difference is that they don't have the hot rack. So it's now they guaranteed one man, one bed. That's something I never, I, I never know about. Torpedoes in the front and the rear, huh? Takes her a mile to do a U-turn. Wow. <laughs> it's funny because always in the movies they always show the torpedoes coming in the front. Yeah. Never now, in the rear. Well, the thing is, is that this room, uh, this is your planned room because you have sixteen in here, eight in the back. So you have more shots, more reloads. This is your planned attack room. Uh, Pardon me, that back torpedo compartment is your shit room. There's shit sitting <laughs> behind us. So any, that's your last resort. Um, Can a submarine navigate in reverse? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's just, it goes a little bit slower. So technically, I could think we can go both ways. Mm -hmm. Go reverse to torpedo somebody. Yeah. It's very hard to train crew members, especially upper level for these things, because you work in 3D with these things instead of just on the surface with the regular boat. What was the average time to load and shoot ponders? And an experienced crew of one three level these things in about a minute. Really? That's for foot sword. That's a knock meter. This little fan blade down the bottom, you load that in, it's like a little pelican thing. That's also your hydrophone. That's where they mount the microphone up here. That's a It's like a little rubber piece down below. 16 sucks into it. Was 16 torpedoes here and four in the back? Eight in the back. Four out, four in. 
Oh, in so this room, there's six tubes in the front, so I have six torpedoes in and then ten out for reloads. So did this bed help to load the uh, torpedoes, or did they they, put they drop it down? Up? Okay. They drop it down. This little this little thing here, you lift it up, drop the train, lower it down. Still functioning. Mm-hmm. Nice. Uh, then the braces that you see inside of the loading bay is a reinforcement because that's a weak point in the hole. That one bends a little bit more than the rest of the boat does. Oh no, good. Um, <clears throat> So what's the minimum quantity of people you need to use navigate one of these? With, with all the, the with mi minimum wartime conditions is 70. That's the skeleton crew for this submarine. 70 people? 70 people. To operate this. To operate this submarine in wartime conditions. Honestly, the, if I gave y'all about a year, the six of us would probably do it. <laughs> wow, well, that's crazy. Uh, if there is a weak point along the whole submarine that they say, well, we need to protect this like the depth charge. Whenever you go into water, the depth charge they use to sink these submarines, it doesn't have to hit you. It's a shockwave that gets you. Exactly. That shockwave scatters throughout the whole boat all at the same time, and it needs to find one weak point. Especially when you're underwater, because you have that tension and the submarine being compressed. Finds that one weak point, shatters it, the boat rips itself apart. So it was four chambers, the whole submarine, this one? There are nine rooms. There, yeah, there are nine watertight doors. So you pull low yeah. separate. How many can you lose before you go down? Two. Two. And well two, not down, but you know what I mean. Well yeah. two ideally, but it really depends how deep you are. Yeah. How deep you are, what compartments they are, how many guys are still kicking and if they're conscious or not. Unfortunately if one went out, I guess the people in there went out and you, you close lose. them off prematurely before you go into battle stations so for damage ready. control. And they do not open them. Yeah. You lose that crew. You lose that you lose those people. It's the risk you have to take. Especially since, you know, you, you Honestly, anything above a 50 caliber would pretty much penetrate this hole. Yeah. Uh, I will say, this is the last compartment you'll have me in for the tour. Y'all have any final questions about anything you're seeing? I guess every question that have come to my mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say, if you do have more, um, I don't know if they're still here or not, but all those old farts you saw on the way in, uh, sitting in the lobby, <laughs> most of those guys are old sub uh, One of them was actually on board this submarine in about the late 60s, right before he decommissioned it. Um, good guys, they're all nuts. They're good guys. And I saw a, a bunch of stickers. They're still on Turkish. They're not yeah. on English. Yeah, if we haven't fixed it, we yeah. haven't taken the label off. Yep. Uh, nine times out of ten, though, you take a scraper and you scrape the label off. They sell the original English ones from the 60s on the back side. So Turkey just went, eh. Oh, you take it off, flip it on. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> uh, Why not? <laughs> the state or the city... How much support do you guys get to keep these? So we're we're part of the North Little Rock City Parks. So we're a city park. Okay. Uh, we get a lot of support from them. Uh, we get we get some tax money through the park service through a hotel tax, like a half cent tax in hotel rooms and stuff like that and rentals. Uh, but yeah, we get a lot of support from them. How about from the U.S. Navy? Or Navy Department so or? that's the funny thing. This summary you're standing on is one of the few museum ships in the United States, and it's not owned by the Navy. We're not on loan from the Navy. North Little Rock owns this summary. The tugboat is on loan from the Navy. These torpedoes are on loan from the Navy. But the summary herself, she's ours. Because we bought her. Well, yeah. Nevertheless, you are promoting. You yeah. are educating. Yeah. Does yes. any help? We do, yes. If we, if we request it, we will get it. Okay. What other organizations in related to this come to this and this? So uh, we, have a, we have a metric crap ton of summary unions. We're in the middle of the United States. We're a nice little hub for any sort of boat reunions and things like that for some service. Uh, we have a group next week. I forget the boat that's doing the reunion, uh, but they we have, we have constant reunions down here for other submarines, things like that. All the plaques of all the different boats that are inside the museum lobby, those are reunions that we've held. You know, you know during First World War and Second World War, like how many different kind of submarines they had? On service, so hand. for the United States, uh, during World War II, we had two primary ones. We have what's known as a Gato class, which if you've ever been to Alabama, USS Drum, she's uh -huh. a Gato. So she's a class right before this one. The Baleo class was an improvement upon the Gato. They gave her a thicker hole and a little bit more space in the inside, but she can go under for a little bit further. Right. Gato going under 450, we can go down to 600. Right. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This submarine here is the station wagon Cadillac of submarines in World War II. This, one. this is the big one. This is a big one. This is the big one. This crap. Yes. All... German submarines are about a third less. 
right, so far way up. Uh, I'll be the last man up. Um, there's two ways to get up out of here. You can go straight up the ladder to the very top, but there's a side hatch on the left, three fourths way up the ladder. Either way you go, get you out of here, just go towards the light. I just recommend going up straight. When I go through that side hatch, I have to fall like a lawn chair to get through it. It hurts me and makes me look funny, so I'd recommend going up straight. Mm -hmm. uh, but y'all can head on up. I'll be the last man up. And then if y'all get up on top and you don't have a question, y'all are free to go. Don't wait for me out in that heat. But thank y'all very much. Well, really thank you very much for the information and the education. Hey, thanks, buddy. Yes, sir. I just want to turn around and take a part of it. So people always navigate with the instruments. They never have like a, like a view or, or a view close up to the surface or a Well, that was the submarine tour, guys. Storm Rider out. <laughs>